everyone, we'll get started. I just wanna welcome everybody to part two of our Building Resilience webinar series with our partners here at MindWise Innovations. My name is Kate Bergstrom. I'm a Senior Associate Commissioner here at the League and really thrilled to be kicking things off today and introducing our session. Hopefully you were able to join us for part one, which we did back in early March, but if not, we do have our recording available. I will drop that into the chat in a little bit. It's on our site as well. Um, so please feel free to revert back to um, our, our first session where we talked, you know, about identifiers um, as it relates to, you know, psychological safety uh, and building team cultures around that. Um, today, we're going to focus more on stress and its impact on us as individuals, uh, both the, with the physical, the mental, and emotional. And then also, uh, Alex and Lisa have built in a number of practical ways for us to talk about self-care and making that a regular occurrence in our lives. Um, so we're thrilled to have Lisa and Alex back with us here for the second session. Um, I will quickly introduce uh, the two of them before we get into our housekeeping. I know I'm sure there are many returners from part one. So we'll, uh, we'll jump into that and then uh, I'll turn things over to the two of them. So Lisa Desai is the Director of Behavioral Health Consulting at MindWise Innovations, a division of Riverside Community Care. Dr. Desai has over 20 years of clinical and administrative experience experience across delivery systems in college counseling centers, community mental health, hospitals, and private practice. Dr. Desai oversees the MindWise Behavioral Health Screening Platform and regularly consults with partners across various sectors. Dr. Desai is committed to understanding and addressing the cultural context in which mental health, which, which men, impacts mental health, excuse me. I have personally had the pleasure of uh, you know, working with Lisa and seeing her in action on other student athlete uh, mental health related forums and really excited to have her back with us uh, and, and the group today. We have Alexandra Pradas with over 10 years of experience working with youth and their families in the fields of education and mental health. Alex currently serves as the program director of the Needham Community Service Agency at Riverside Community Care, which supports youth with severe emotional disturbances and their families. Alex is a behavioral health trainer at MindWise Innovations and an outpatient clinician at Trade Port Counseling and Mediation Associates based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Alex specializes in providing EMDR therapy to individuals who have experienced trauma. She is committing, committed to helping individuals and communities find healing and is passionate about collaborating with organizations to support mental health awareness and increasing access to that support. So Alex and Lisa, thanks so much for being here today. Really excited to have you. I am gonna just quickly make a few housekeeping notes and then I'll turn it over to our experts. Um, as you'll see, this is a setup to be a meeting style. So um, as opposed to a webinar, you'll have the ability um, to have your camera on. Should you wish to, you can keep it off, whatever you, pr you prefer, but we do ask that you keep yourself muted the whole time unless otherwise noted. Uh, we are highly encouraging interaction and engagement through the session, and we plan to utilize the chat function. So first, we'll have some points where Alex and Lisa will be asking questions and looking for feedback. Uh, we encourage you to drop things in the chat. You can respond to their prompts. We did this in part one. It was a really helpful way to just sort of further the dialogue and make it specific to your needs, your questions, and what you're feeling and thinking in this environment. Um, also helpful you, for you to see each other's thoughts and opinions and perspectives on, on some of these prompts. Um, second, there's asking questions. We will carve out time at the end for questions, but we really encourage you to ask questions throughout. Um, Lisa and Alex will take, the, take those questions and sort of build them into uh, the dialogue as we go on, and I can feed them those questions. Uh, since we're not in a webinar format, if you'd like to submit a question, um, you can go ahead and do that in the chat. If you don't want to submit a question that everyone can see publicly and do it in more of an anonymous forum, instead of chatting to everybody or everyone, just chat, chat directly to America East Conference username, and then we will get that uh, question incorporated into the conversation while protecting your identity. And then lastly, we are recording this session, as you can see, to make it available to a broader audience after the fact, or if one of your colleagues wasn't able to make it during this time, we know it's busy right now, so just be mindful that we are recording this session. Lisa, Alex, thanks for being here today. So excited, I'm gonna turn things over to you too. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you everyone for making the time to be here today. We do know how incredibly busy your schedules are. And so um, Alex and I are hoping to make this um, really as helpful and practical and really stimulate some thinking 
hopefully discussion, as Kate said, via the chat. Um, so for those of you that were here for the first part of our program, both are really about looking at resiliency and how to talk about mental health, how to approach mental health and stress in a way that feels helpful um, and in a way that feels as if we're furthering um, the conversation. So last time we focused on um, how to support your student athletes' mental health um, and create that culture of psychological safety. Today, this really is about you in your roles as athletic directors, staff, coaches, um, and really, really this concept that self-care is not selfish, it's actually at the core um, of everything all of us can do professionally and personally. Um, and really to also think about in this pandemic, and now it's been over a year that so much has happened between the national arrest in our country, um, the election, and of course the pandemic, there has been a tremendous amount of stress that also has impacted folks in terms of their um, professional identity and professional possibilities. So also to put aside you know, a few moments to have some discussion about how that's been for you, um, we will be sending um, a very brief three question survey in the next week after this. So if you have follow-up thoughts and suggestions, please do um, share them with us. We do want this to be as interactive as possible. And with that. Yes, hello everyone. So happy to be here. We are gonna just jump right in and start with our first poll question for all of you. Um, so the question is how often do you check in with yourself regarding your stress level? Multiple times a day, once a day, weekly. Oh, we got some people right, right on the button here. Okay. What a great response rate. Wow. Yeah, this is so I'm so impressed. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've never seen a poll completed so quickly. <laughs> no, me neither. Oh, okay. That's great. And a little bit of a mix here. Yeah, that really, um, really solid mix. Mm -hmm. um, it's because we're all stressed. I see someone put in the chat. It's an easy, yeah. easy question to answer, right? right. That's, that's right. why we're here. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, what I'm, um, what I'm really impressed with is um, that 32%, I mean, you know, uh, a good amount of people are checking in once a day or weekly, which is great. That is great. Um, I also think that that the fact that it's really um, spread across multiple times a day to not sure how to check in with yourself. Hopefully, what we'll talk about today will be um, helpful to everyone, um, whether you're used to checking in on a daily basis or whether you're not sure how to do that. Alex, any thoughts on the poll results? No, I just thank everyone for participating so quickly. And, and like you said, I, I think we have some tips for all of you to think about how to, how to check in more about your stress level. Um, should that be something you think would be helpful, which we do. Um, <laughs> so thank you all. Oh, hold on, let me get to my... So just to start off, um, kind of setting the table as all of you in leadership positions um, and whatever leadership position that may be, but we often think that when we're in a leadership position, we can't show any vulnerabilities. And certainly um, I can only imagine when, when you're dealing with college athletics or athletics in general, the emphasis on physical strength, on physical agility, um, all of that kind of that physical toughness also translate to the need for mental toughness, which makes a lot of sense. It's also important to think about reaching out for support, reaching out for help, um, modeling that both in times that you need it for yourself, but also modeling that for your peers and your team and your student athletes really shows a tremendous amount of courage. So there's a lot in the corporate world that's being talked about in terms of looking at vulnerability from the lens of courage. And really encourage you throughout this conversation to think about how do you think about help seeking? How do you think about if you turn to somebody either to help them or to help seek for yourself? Does that feel that you're being weak? Because many of us buy into these age old notions of that. Or can you identify that, wow, I'm proud of myself for taking this step to get the help I need or to offer help to someone else? And as leaders often 
you're putting your, you're putting others above you, right? Because in a leadership position, you're you're impacting others, you're affecting others, um, you're you're in some way supporting other people. But it goes back to to that that this classic line of put your ox oxygen mask on first, right? When you're when you're on a plane, you put yours on before the person next to you because you're not going to be that effective, supportive, helpful leader if you're not taking care of yourself first. It's really, we really would like for you to think about this as a necessity, not a luxury, right? But putting yourself first, putting your mental health first, in addition to your physical health is going to allow you to be the leader that you want to be and model for those around you, the importance of taking care of your mind and your body. Now we acknowledge that self-care is sometimes associated uh, with doing things like taking bubble baths and taking vacation and getting a massage, right? Things that involve money and time, um, not, not something we all have lots of, right? Um, and, and it's so much more than that. Self-care is so much more than that. And so we really want to take, take a few moments to tease, tease out what is self-care, right? Giving you a breakdown of how we understand it so that it's more helpful to you because it's not a one size fits all. Right? It has to be individualized to, to you and what you need. So we think about self-care in terms of the three R's, reflection, regulation, and relaxation. So what do we mean by reflection? Reflection means quite simply noticing what's happening. Right? Reflection is noticing your reactions, your patterns. What are your push buttons? What are the things that get under your skin? And how do you typically respond to those things? Noticing is important. Reflecting is important because if you notice what's going on, then you can plan intentional self-care. That's why we believe reflection is the most important R, okay? It starts with noticing. Um, it's noticing what you're doing and how what you're doing impacts how you feel. It can be as simple as checking in with yourself in the middle of the day around how is this day going, right? I personally reflect usually around noon on my water intake. I think about how's my day going and have I had any water? Cause I'm, I really need to drink a lot of water throughout the day or I'll, I'll burn out pretty quickly by two, three o'clock. Um, so again, reflection, it's about noticing how you're doing, what's going on around you. It can also be about reflecting on your, on your work and your relationships uh, with colleagues and with those that you support. It, it means, Reflecting on the behaviors of others sometimes, it, it can be helpful for our own self-care to sort of take a step back and think about whatever it is that person just did that is making you feel a little bit stressed and, and reflecting on it. What might be the reason why they're doing that, right? So reflections about noticing what's going on with you, what's happening in your environment, and maybe what's going on with other people. And then there's regulation. So we think about regulation as shifting your energy to a place that's comfortable for whatever it is that you're doing, right? We all, we all experience shifts in our energy throughout the day. Some of us wake up like ready to go um, and some of us don't. And we do things to sort of modulate how we feel in our bodies and in our minds. And regulation is, it's about, it's a skill about uh, shifting shifting how you feel in your body, knowing those push buttons, like I said before, and knowing what to do with your stress and how to respond. It's about responding in the moment when you notice that you're feeling stress. And it's also about doing things proactively so that you can tolerate stress, maybe when you're not predicting that it happens. I always have next to me, silly putty, because I just never know when I'm gonna need to do something with my hands to regulate how I'm feeling. Um, I highly encourage people to think about, we'll talk more about this later, think about a, a bag or a toolbox or something that they have with them when they're working, at least when they're working, um, with some, some things that make you feel a little bit more in control, something to do with your stress. Again, Silly Putty, it's been around for a very long time for a reason. It's because it works for a lot of people. <laughs> Um, and, and so, and then lastly, the, the last R is relaxation. And again, this is, 
this is often um, understood as what self-care is, but as you now can see, it's, it's just one part of what self-care is. Relaxation is about keeping yourself strong and balanced. It means play, being playful in whatever way that means for you. Um, it could be playing with kids. It can be playing with animals. Um, it could be listening to music that feels like it's calming and um, joyful for you. So, so we really, the, the hope in taking this time to think about these three R's is to, to make self-care not such a vague, superficial sort of topic, but really thinking about what does it mean when you dig a little bit deeper? And then when you know what it means, then you can, you can sort of take more action. Because again, taking care of your mental health is just as important as your physical health. We have to keep our bodies healthy and our minds healthy because they, they, they impact each other. Our minds and our bodies, they're, they're related and they impact each other and regular daily self-care doesn't have to be anything too, too tremendous or expensive, um, can really help to mitigate long-term impacts of stress. And, and Alex, it struck me that the reflection piece, that kind of noticing is very much related to the polling question, the polling question of, I'm not really sure how to check in about my stress level. For those of you that kind of aren't sure, I think that reflection is that checking in, the exactly. noticing. Um, so I really liked that piece of it as well. You. So you're, I think you are now gonna guide us through a brief exercise. I am, I'm gonna guide us through an exercise, a brief mindfulness exercise. All you need is yourself. Um, but before we jump into that, I'd like for you all just to take a moment and notice on this topic of noticing how you're feeling in your body right now. And do a quick scan if you need to, maybe from your head down to your toes, just check in and notice how you feel in your body. And if you're willing, it would be really helpful I think for all of us if, if you put a word or two into the chat, to sort of capture how it is that you're feeling in your body right now. I'm not seeing the chats. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, yep. Anxious, tight, focused. That's good. Tense. Mm -hmm. uh, drained. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Relax. I'm glad that there are some folks that are feeling focused and relaxed. That's good. Yeah. I can relate to the lower back pain with all the sitting. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, overwhelmed. Back pain is one of those, the mo one of the most common um, impacts of stress. Of course, there are other reasons too, but we feel it in our backs. I appreciate, we appreciate you, you sharing um, a little bit about how it is that you're feeling. It's important whether you share this in the chat or not, just to notice so that you can, as we go through this mindful exercise, check in beforehand, check in with yourself after to see if this is something that is actually helpful for you, right? So what, I, what I'm gonna invite you to do is to, if you're not already, sit as comfortably as you can in the chair that you're in. And we'll begin by closing your eyes or you can gaze softly at a point in front of you, whatever's comfortable. And notice your body in the chair or in the seat that you're in. Notice your feet on the ground feeling supported by the seat, the armrests if you have them. Just kind of take a moment to land where you're at. I invite you now to notice your breathing. When you inhale, think the words, I know I'm inhaling. And as you exhale, think the words, I know I'm exhaling. As you breathe in, you repeat, I know I'm inhaling. 
As you breathe out, I know I'm exhaling. Now, imagine a balloon inflating in your belly as you inhale and deflating as you exhale. Together with the statements, I know I'm inhaling, I know I'm exhaling. Bring all of your attention to this exercise right now. If something distracts you, that's okay. Please just gently return to those statements, I know I'm inhaling, I know I'm exhaling. We'll do this for about a minute. I'll let you know when the time is up, but of course you can stop at any time. Take two, do two more cycles of the breathing, intentional breathing. And when you're ready, you can come back. Okay. And lastly, before we move on and shift gears a little bit, just ask you to, to notice how you feel in your body now. If there's been any shift in any direction for you, I'm not gonna ask you to share in the chat, but just notice yourself. Um, I hope that this has been something that has helped you land, feel more grounded. Um, maybe the, the first break you took all day and certainly throughout our time, if there's, questions about it or comments, we certainly welcome that. But we appreciate you being interactive with us and, and engaging this in this activity. Something only takes a couple of minutes. It's free, right? Uh, all you need is your body. You can do it anywhere, anytime. Thank you for that, Alex. You know, I think what I was aware of is that, um, I mean, I just don't take those moments. I mean, I think that we don't think about taking those moments because we get on our fast track for the day. We go from one thing to another and it's hard to remember to take those moments. Um, it actually, you know, it's a good lead in to think about the culture that supports self-care. Um, and again, you know, as Alex said, self-care is not take a half a day off. It does not have to be that because that's not realistic for most of us. We can take time off, but we're really thinking about how do you build self-care in in the way that you think about your physical fitness, you think about your nutrition, um, exercising, building in walks, those kinds of things. So the culture, we think about a culture that supports um, not only self-care, but supporting one another. Um, and so there are two different kind of, two different cultural ways that we think about. One is psychological safety. So for those of you that joined us in the last um, webinar, we talked a bit about this. It's become kind of a hot topic these days and a hot term, certainly in the cultural world or the corporate world. So you, many of you probably heard about it. It's very much about um, a team culture, a work environment where not only leadership, I mean, leadership models, open communication, a trusting environment, building trust among team members, among the workforce, uh, but also that when you make mistakes, it's okay to admit that you made a mistake. It's okay to say, I goofed, I don't know how to do this, I made a mistake, rather than thinking about how do I get out of letting anybody know I've made that mistake. Um, and the other very important piece is it allows for feedback um, to go all across job roles in a work environment. So it's not that in the hierarchy, certain people give feedback to certain people that 
um, quote report to them, but that the team can give uh, feedback to leadership and that leadership not only is open to seeing it, hearing it, but is actually actively seeking it out. Um, so that and also a trauma-informed approach, we touched about upon this, I think, last time. And this really, it, it's, um, it kind of sounds very clinical and complicated. It's really the awareness and the knowledge that um, if you look at the statistics, six out of 10 men and five, well, what is, whoops, got that wrong. Oh, this is not, I'm sorry. These are wrong statistics. It's six out of 10 men and five out of 10 women. So don't pay attention what's on the screen. That's my mistake. Um, so, but if you look at 50% of women and a larger percent of men have experienced at least trauma once in their lives, um, the idea of the trauma-informed approach is it's not our responsibility and it, it, it hinges on people's privacy to dig for information. That's not the right thing to do necessarily at all but it's more about creating a safe environment for everyone. Because by doing that, um, whether we know who's experienced trauma or not, we're creating a respectful, supportive environment for all. So when you think about um, where you're working and your way of contributing to the culture, important to keep these pieces in mind because this really opens the door for us to check in about our stress, for us to check in about what do I need to take care of myself today. So um, we all know that stigma plays a huge role in a lot of parts of our lives. Um, certainly in mental health, stigma gets in the way of seeking help, talking about it, um, and, and even thinking about whether it's okay to find a clinician. And if medication is prescribed, is it okay to take that because of our own stigma around medication? Also our family members, friends, belief about whether it's okay to take medication. So um, best way, one of the best ways to chip away at stigma is to talk openly about it. Um, we know only too well what's happening in the last year in this country that stereotypes can be very dangerous. Um, they perpetuate stigma. And because stigma breeds in silence, when we don't talk about it, um, in a sense, we're buying into it. Um, so we're big believers in continue, start the conversation here, continue the conversation. And again, in order to do that, one has to have that supportive environment. Mm -hmm. Because also stigma, feeling alone in what you're going through, not necessarily knowing how to reach out for support increases our stress level, right? So, so when we, when we back up a little and talk about stress, what, what is it? It's something that does not discriminate, right? It impacts us all. We asked you a question about stress at the top of this hour and you responded immediately, right? We, we, know, we know what it is. We all experience it in, in various ways. Um, and stress is a physical response. It's a normal physical response to a demand, um, to, to things in our environment, to people, to places. Um, and often we associate certain people or things with stressful situations. It is, like I said, a physical response um, and has, there's a whole complicated cascade of events that happen in our body when we're stressed, but, but most people can uh, relate to that heart pounding feeling, right? Or that shortness of breath, um, that feeling like you might be tingling a little bit when, you, when you're when you stressed. Um, certainly that is not, those are not the only experiences of stress, but, but it's something that is, it is a normal part of life. Um, and it can also be something that can lead to, to some more serious health issues. Um, and, and the two types of stress that we talk about are chronic or ongoing. Um, so stress that occurs over a long period of time without a true, without a real true measure of rest or something more acute, right? A sudden spike in our stress levels. The truth is both types of stress, acute and chronic, can impact our physical health. And our, and our mental health. Uh, there are lots of studies that show uh, that stress impacts or contributes to medical conditions like heart disease and high blood pressure, and certainly it can impact memory and, and learning. And our response to stress can be positive, 
at times, right? I think it's important that we acknowledge that too, that um, stress can be motivating. It can be exciting. Uh, that stress that you feel before a game, right? Or before um, a big event, that's it's something you're looking forward to. There's, there's positive stress response that we experience. Um, and then there's more tolerable stress, not positive, but, but tolerable. Um, and that stress that we experience that usually is buffered by the support of others, right? The, the supports we have in place, our self-care that we do for ourselves. And then of course, the, the third type of response we can have to stress is something that feels more intolerable, right? Something that happens when we experience too much stress for too long, right? or maybe too much too soon, and we don't have the support that we need around us. We talked a lot last time with you about resilience and the importance of, of peer support and social support for resiliency and being able to cope and, and move through real difficult things. Um, so so that, that's an important piece to consider later when we talk more about practical tips for self-care. Um, but we thought we'd pull back a little bit and sort of talk about what is stress actually. Um, and so, so, what it, so what is, how does it manifest? How do we um, experience it? Well, all sorts of ways. There's a range of reactions that we have to stress, physical and cognitive, emotional. Um, and so in our bodies, some of you commented when we did the mindfulness activity um, that you were feeling pain, you were feeling tightness. Um, some folks are fatigued. We often feel stress in the form of, um, of fatigue and because we're, our sleep is disrupted as a result of stress. Um, there's also something that happens in our bodies when we've experienced too much stress for too long, our immunity starts to be compromised. And so there are, there are folks that will become frequently sick or have, have infections as a result of too much, as a result of too much stress. Um, so we feel it in our body. We notice it emotionally as well, especially with the chronic stress um, that can lead to feelings of depression and sadness and a loss of confidence, um, sometimes indifference, right? And apathy, um, too much stress for too long can have us also changing the way that we think. Um, so we may start to see things through a negative, a negative lens, right? Things are not going well. They're never going to go well. It's, it's really easy to get caught up in that, in that thinking when you are experiencing a lot of stress for, for quite some time. Um, we notice that stress can occupy our mind in, in ways of, um, in terms of worrying and sort of this obsessive thinking about things, right? That, that's a sign, that can be a sign of stress when we just can't let something go because we're overly stressed. Um, and, and inability to make decisions in the way that we typically would when we're feeling calm and in control and less stressed. And then of course, stress impacts our behavior, right? We talked, we talked a fair bit about some of this last time, um, but when, when we're stressed for long periods of time, or maybe when there's acute stress, we experience changes in our appetite. It could be that we have an increase in our appetite. It could be that we, we lose a sense of desire for food, right? Or, or wanting to eat. It could be sleep issues, insomnia. Um, I think there's so many ways that these connect to each other, right? You can draw lines <laughs> all over the place here um, because if your mind is, if you're stressed in your mind and you're worrying a lot, you're probably gonna have trouble sleeping. And when that happens, you'll, you'll be fatigued and have headaches, right? It all sort of connects here, but we wanted you to see that stress, it impacts both the body and the mind. Again, back to why it's so important to notice what's going on, because if you can notice, then you can hopefully do something about what you're experiencing. I think I just want to call out the substance use um, yes. example here, Alex, because I think it's a bit different from some of the other examples in the sense that, you know, we all try to cope the best we can when we're stressed and when we're under just, just pressure or when we're feeling tired, anxious, down. Um, and so substance use is a good example of we try to cope 
Sometimes we cope in healthy ways. We work out, go for a run, we talk to a friend. And sometimes we, we cope in ways that aren't so healthy for us. So um, I think substance use is an example of that. Food can also be an example of that. Um, you know, whether it's comfort eating, whether it's restricting, because it feels like if I can't control anything else in my life, I'm going to control how much I eat. So just really important to be aware of in the response to stress or any of those behaviors ones that are leading us down a path or maybe immediate gratification or immediate relief, but it could take us down another rabbit hole, um, which, which is not healthy or productive for us. So thanks for reviewing the big picture though. That's, um, it's, it's amazing the ways in which stress really does impact us. And when it goes on for too long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I was also looking at that thinking that burnout is a result of um, excessive stress, ongoing stress, also kind of a sense of hopelessness. So many of you um, know that burnout was in the last year, I think in 2020 or 2019 was classified by the World Health Organization as an occupational disorder. So it was recognized that the symptoms and signs um, lead to a syndrome, if you will, that is recognized now in the workplace. And so burnout can sometimes overlap with depression in that, um, as you see here with the sides, a lack of interest, low motivation, emotional exhaustion, um, lack of focus, all of that also can go with, be with feeling depressed. One way to check in with, is this more of a global feeling down, feeling depressed, or is this really more burnout in, in at work or in what I'm doing professionally, is to think about when you're not engaged with work situations, are you feeling a different level of energy? Are you feeling a different level of interest? Um, and, and if you start to explore something just for fun, a hobby, are you feeling energized by that? So those are signs and those are ways to differentiate, is this more of a global depression that I'm feeling, or is this really something where I need to look to see what I can do with work, what I can do with my work life that can be a relief to me. Um, I think we have a question after this. I hope we have a question because I would love to hear um, people's thoughts about what, oh good, <laughs> um, about what, what people are feeling, hearing from you about the impact of stress, burnout, what you're noticing in yourself, um, and maybe even sharing tips with one another about when you do notice this, what are you doing that's helped you move a little bit, make some movement? Um, I'm actually also okay, Kate, if, if, if you are, people wanna unmute and just kind of share some thoughts as well. Yeah, absolutely, Lisa, we can do that. So I think it's kind of nice sometimes, yeah. Yeah, just raise your hand. Uh, yeah. Maybe in function like we did last time and we'll unmute you. There's a response in the chat though. Oh. Netflix. <laughs> oh, on? oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different chat discussion about your favorite <laughs> Netflix shows that bring us relief. Migraine. Migraines. So is that someone, Amy? So migraines is a sign, Amy, to you that you're feeling stressed, burned out? Yeah, okay. You know, the physical manifestation is interesting because I think sometimes the physical forces us. I mean, it gives us permission, but it also forces us to take care of ourselves. Mm. Um, lack of motivation. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate what Ashley wrote, becoming one with my bed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about that as a behavior, right? That um, That's a sign that we're stressed is using, using our, our bed, our couches to avoid whatever it is that's stressing us out. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. General apathy, it's a lot, of, a lot of what we talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a couple more in there. 
Prioritizing tasks. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good one. Yep. And I think that prioritizing tasks is a really nice example of what you can do to have some sense of what you can control. There's so much we can't these days in the world and in our lives. That being able to think about what, what tasks can I get to, what tasks are most important can be empowering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fatigue, yeah. Mm -hmm. The apathy, you know, I think again, that's something that we can relate to in terms of COVID fatigue, Mm -hmm. quarantine fatigue, you know, even honestly, I'm, I am a huge believer in wearing the mask everywhere. Um, mask fatigue, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think, so that that can really lead to the apathy. Um, so I, I very much try to think about what personally, um, what brings me happiness, what, what can I do that feels creative, mm -hmm. that when I'm feeling tired regarding work or just feeling like I need a nice break, what could I do to also actively engage my mind differently as well as my body? Someone put in the chat, noticing that they lose patience when they're stressed. Yeah. yeah. So, so many folks, their, their fuse gets real <laughs> short when they're feeling yes. stressed. That absolutely can be a, a signal that you need to take, take some time for yourself. And um, you know, it can be losing patience with ourselves. It can be losing patience with family members. And I think, you know, having kids at home, for those of you that have kids, um, it's, it, it, it's uh, challenging. Yeah. So that's or, a really- and, and animals too, right, Lisa? And you, animals, <laughs> yes. you, you've witnessed me lose my patience a little bit with my, with my puppy. <laughs> but well, I, yeah. Sorry, Alex, go ahead. No, 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 that's okay. I think I think we all, I, I think it's good to notice when you're reacting to things in a way that you typically don't. That's that's usually a sign that that you're stressed and um, it calls for some, some type of self-care. Yeah, yeah. I have, I was going to say, Alex has a puppy. I have a 12 year old dog who's become very high maintenance during COVID. So let's hope that she doesn't interrupt us during our presentation here. So, um, so, the next, we have another poll for you. And, um, and this one is, is related to the idea of stress. How often do you turn to peers, to your peers for support? I was waiting to see some, some folks put that don't comfortable, don't feel comfortable doing so. I think that that very often our experience is, again, as leaders, not being sure who to talk to, how to talk to them when we're feeling stressed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to me that the two group, the largest groups, are kind of at two ends weekly, which is pretty regularly, which I'm, that's fantastic. And then rarely or never. Um, so I'd love to hear from both groups. Maybe mm -hmm. people wanna kind of talk about that now or maybe at the end. Um, that might even be something we put in our follow-up survey. I would love to hear from everyone and especially those two groups that feel like, yeah, I do it weekly and those that, um, that rarely or never do, what's kind of getting in the way of that? It's getting in the way of reaching out to peers. Yeah, Lisa, I was just gonna say, if, if people wanna um, be unmuted and talk about that, they feel comfortable enough for either one of those two groups, someone that put weekly or put rarely or never, I'll, I'll go ahead and unmute them. Absolutely. Or I can use the chat. Yeah. And we, we know this is not easy to talk about, especially I think in a virtual format. Sometimes these are conversations that if we're in the same room, um, it can feel a bit easier. So we totally understand that. Um, we'll be sure to include that in a survey. 
Um, the reason being for those that don't feel comfortable, it's great um, for all of us to know what gets in the way, because that's part of how do you make that culture shift? How do you make that the peer relationship, that support shift? Um, now, some of us are just going to be less comfortable, and that's fine. Everybody has to do what's, what's true for themselves. And, and especially for those that do reach out more regularly, uh, be great to hear tips. Great to hear how did they get to a place where they could do that. And that's information that we can even share as a follow-up to this um, today's program. So thank you, everyone. So, um, you know, this is very much tied to personal and professional growth. And we really wanted to touch upon this because there's been so much um, in the last year, specifically with college students and college athletes about how their lives have been upended. They haven't had practice or they've had to practice on their own. Games have been canceled, meets have been canceled. And so, um, it seems like there's been a decent amount of focus in supporting student athletes through this. And, and Alex and I are kind of wondering um, from your perspective, you know, this is also, this is your professional world and um, ha having to deal with those pieces of what you can't do in your job can definitely create disappointment, create stress, um, maybe some disillusionment. And so, also kind of think about, and again, open it up to you during these times, um, how have you managed that? This could be takeaway for you to be thinking about, for you to share with friends or colleagues if you don't feel you wanna get into that now. Um, and then what does this provide in terms of um, your thinking about the directions you can grow? If you're, um, Alex and I were saying before we started today that one marker of, Am I okay with where I am professionally? Um, can be, how are you feeling pre-COVID? Were you excited about what you were doing? Were you psyched about your profession, your role, how things were going with your team um, or your, your job um, within athletics? Um, or were you not? Because if you were, the thing, if you were feeling really positive and COVID has changed it, then that's, that's a piece of, okay, how do I manage during this time of transition? If there was something that was happening beforehand that felt more like disappointment or um, a growing unrest around something, then that's another piece to think about. Um, so really important to look at the pre and the current and then what you can prepare for in the post. Hey, Lisa, if I could just jump in really quickly. We, yeah. I got an anonymous message here on the, I think from someone that put either never or rarely mm -hmm. was, the challenge there is not having a peer that he or she feels comfortable speaking with, not wanting uh -huh. individuals to know that that person can't handle stress. Um, when they do reach out, it's either to a spouse or, or friends or siblings, um, but but not someone sort of in that professional setting. Yeah. Maybe you, you, you two could touch on that just quickly. Well, I really appreciate the person sharing that. So thank you for sharing that. I, I you know, to me, that goes to write the middle statement here we often compare ourselves to others and feel that others are doing better than we are, that they're coping, they're not struggling. If you even look at, at the, um, some of the responses in the polls and also in the chat, um, we're all experiencing fatigue, anxiety, being very comfortable in our bed. I mean, this is, this is impacting all of us. So these types of conversations um, might be a glimpse into one, reassuring us that you're, we're not alone in this, you're not alone in this. Um, and sometimes it's listening to who's the person that's making, that's, that's showing some vulnerability. Who's a colleague that's admitting to, I had a really rough morning with the kids or oh, man, this is tough because those are the kind of statements that um, create an opening that let you know that that person may be an ally um, in being able to talk with them. And, and giving support to them, but also receiving support from them. Mm -hmm. Alex, thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said, Lisa, you know, and, and it, it's a risk that you're taking, right? We, we recognize that to, to open yourself up and be a little vulnerable with a, with a coworker, with a peer, um, it is, it's a little bit of a risk. And I, again, at some point, it would be so great to hear from the people that, that do check in with their peers regularly, because we know 
that the reward is so high, right? To have family members, neighbors, people in the community that don't have the same roles that we have, they, their empathy and compassion is great, um, but they're not in it in the way that, that you are with your specific role. So it can feel so validating when there's someone who's doing what you do professionally um, and can understand all the, the sort of nuance and, and the complexity. Um, but we, we realize that it is a risk and we, and we think it's one worth taking carefully. Right. Yep. And, if, and if you have friends, family members that you turn to, that's great too. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's really important to follow your intuition, go with your gut feeling and seek out support where it feels right. You know, hopefully you will find, you know, as I was saying, somebody within the professional network, the important thing is that you're getting the support that you need mm -hmm. and that you're looking for. So, um, you know, question again, just around this ambiguous loss of so much. I mean, it's being called ambiguous loss because, well, some of us have unfortunately um, people died in our lives, in our communities, families, um, workplaces, perhaps. Um, you know, other losses have been loss of traditions, loss of gathering, seeing people, routine, um, so many things. So from that ambiguous loss perspective, there very much can be an impact on professional identity. So would anybody be great to hear from folks in terms of how you feel this has impacted you or your peers? And you could speak to general observations. It also doesn't have to be from your personal experience. Oh, Caitlin. Wonderful. Caitlin, I'm going to unmute you. I think I did it. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so I think with COVID, just the way our athletics department has had to rally together, take on different roles. I'd like to say I'm an expert camera operator now, even though I'm normally <laughs> the box office manager. Um, our production manager might argue otherwise, but, um, you know, I, I feel like the lines of what we do on a daily basis have been blurred. And I yes. think that has helped build new skills. Like I'm, I'm proud to say, okay, I can fill in on a camera if need be, but it also kind of takes away what I'm proud of and how I can, you know, toot my own horn and say, look, this is what I'm able to do. These are the efficiencies I've built. And it, so I feel like it's, it's kind of been a gray area where we might have more collective medals as a team, but for individual performance, there's less merit. And I think it's also put us in situations where we have so many kudos, which is good, but a lot of times they're not pointing out the right people and it's the team effort. So then, you know, if I see a colleague who is not putting their weight in kind of rallying together, they're still getting the kudos and acknowledgement. So it's, it's been a challenging time in that sense. Um, but I think ultimately like the blurring of the lines and roles um, is a loss to me. Uh, that's, thank you for sharing that, Caitlin. I, I think that is so on target in terms of the benefits, you know, the kind of the skills that you're developing and, and great, awesome for you that you're recognizing those skills, but, but completely understand what you're saying about blurring those lines and, and then feeling um, that loss of recognition around how you've continued in your role to continue, you know, building those operations, building the efficiencies but how does that get recognized? And so it strikes me that that would be really good input for whatever staff you're part of, team you're part of, um, organizational structure you're part of. There was just, I just read something yesterday or the day before about how um, recognition on the job can improve job satisfaction tremendously. So I think you're hitting upon an incredibly important point. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you for sharing that. It has me has me thinking about my own team that I support and and how true I had not thought that's another ambiguous loss that I just had not 
thought about, um, but can totally understand, can, yeah, totally understand. And it's so motivating, it's so encouraging to have that recognition. It's, it's important that we, we've been so creative this year, right? We've had to flex different skills and, and grow in certain ways. And I think, you know, this is an area as leaders, we have to think about how to recognize individuals mm -hmm. uh, when we're physically separated for the most part and not seeing everything, um, but rather focus. The big picture is important, but people need to yeah. feel heard and, and, and recognized. And, and, you know, and also Kate, when I think this is, this to me raises a whole different discussion also about how do you also kind of, um, how do you recognize yourself? I mean, how do you feel okay saying, hey, I've actually done this and, and feel okay talking about an accomplishment and, and sharing that pride in yourself? And I think, um, you know, again, that's a whole different discussion in the interest of time, we do need to move on. Um, but please continue to share your thoughts about this, either in the chat or even afterwards. Um, we'd love to hear your, um, your observations. So um, Alex, I think we just have a few minutes. So yes. maybe sharing a few tips or about exercises would be great. Yes, I'm determined that we get these practical <laughs> tips in. That's part of, I'm sure why some of you are here. Um, so so some, some exercises, some thoughts about how you can build in ref, uh, reflection, regulation, and relaxation. So remember, ref, uh, reflection is about noticing, noticing what's going on internally for you and what's happening in your environment. One practical exercise that um, you can walk away with today um, is to keep a mood journal. Or there are tons of apps nowadays that um, you can where you can track your moods and, and how you're doing. I think some of them even prompt you actually throughout the day to check in with yourself. Um, and and at in, so at intervals throughout the day, on a scale, whatever scale you choose, maybe it's zero to ten, um, just note how you're doing. Right? How stressed are you between zero and 10? Zero being not stressed at all, super relaxed and chill, and 10 being as, as most stressed as you can imagine. And, and note the times that you're recording your stress level. Um, and then perhaps at the end of the week, the end of the month, reflect back on, on that journal, on that tracking system. Because when we notice patterns, um, that's when we can, we can take action and, and implement other parts of self-care. Um, when we, when we know what our trouble, when our trouble spots, spots are 99% of the time, when we record information about how we're doing and look back at it, we learn something that's incredibly valuable. So that's one tip I have for you. Um, the other would be, um, so, oh, it's so hard to, it's so hard so, to narrow it down. You know, Alex, you know what I'm thinking is why don't we do this um, in case people have to scoot in a couple of minutes? Why don't we also, if you're okay with it, we could also send this in a, in a follow-up email, the specific mm -hmm. ideas. How's that sound? Absolutely. That was great. That way we're not rushed and um, you can have it and, and refer back to it as needed. Um, so that's a great idea. Because I know you've got, I, you shared them with me, so I know you've got some great ideas. Um, so why don't we share that? And then um, any in the survey, you can certainly share any challenges that we've not addressed. We want to hear what we didn't cover, which would have been useful to you. We'll also share this with you, which is um, safety predictability control. It's really a framework we I think touched upon it last time to manage and really cope during times of stress, uncertainty, crisis. Um, things that you can do every day, your family members can do, you could do at work, you could do for yourself. Um, so we will send you this, um, Alex will send your, the, the three R examples of exercises. And finally, this is my favorite slide. Last Alex. but not least. <laughs> yes. So important before you log off of this webinar, please, we invite you to make a pledge to yourself. Identify one thing that you can commit to in the interest of reflection, regulation, relaxation, somewhere to start. Okay. Pledge to yourself. Um, if, if you wanna put it in the chat, of course, it's always helpful to share ideas with one another, but really this is about you taking a small step towards, again, an effort to bring more relaxation and uh, reflection and rejuvenation and joy into your life. 
And we can't always get to a place like in this photo to, to have those times. So it's really, it could be ten, a 10 minute walk. It could be logging off your computer and your phone for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can really be small, small kinds of things that you do for yourself and um, making them a habit, trying to do one of those things once a day um, can really make a big difference. So um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, we're right up to the end of the hour. We really appreciate your being here. And, um, and Kate has our information. So if you have any follow-up questions for her, you will be getting a survey of these materials. You can certainly um, be in touch with her with any questions. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Alex. Really wonderful stuff today. I know I, I personally have a lot of takeaways, so much appreciated for the practical tips. Um, and, and as we mentioned at the top, this is, was recorded, so we will make this available to everyone so they can view afterwards again or share with their colleagues. We'll, we'll share it around the league to make sure that we get as many eyes on this practical uh, information as possible. So Alex, Lisa, thank you so, so much for being with us for both part one and part two of this Building uh, Resilience webinar series. It's been fantastic and so valuable to all of us. Well, thank you everyone. And thanks for your participation. It, it, uh, it made the whole thing. So thank you for that. Take care. Have a great day. Take thanks care, everybody. Bye-bye.